All right, so good evening and welcome to Youth Neuro Australia's Mental Health and the Environment Panel, which is being held in Mental Health Week, which runs from the 9th to the 16th of October. My name is Yamema and I'm YNA Events Coordinator and I will be your host this evening. So this event is being live streamed onto YouTube, our website and our Facebook page. So welcome everyone, no matter where you're coming from. So before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I'm presenting from the traditional lands of the Darug people and also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you're all streaming in from today. I'd like to extend this respect to elders past and present and welcome all First Nations viewers with us this evening. So just a bit of background before we get started. As a nonprofit charity, YNA is focused on delivering, delivering accessible and educational STEM-based opportunities to undergraduates and high school students across Australia, including educational workshop, workshops, networking opportunities and webinars. So today we brought together a very unique and multidisciplinary panel to discuss mental health and our environment, including what you can do to maximize the benefits of your surroundings. We'll be focusing on three key themes today, mental health in the home, our learning, working in urban environments, and then we will end with a discussion of digital spaces and how that interacts with our mental health. Our panelists tonight are interior architectural lecturer, Dr. Elania Drummond, clinical psychiatry researcher, Professor Ian Hickey, applied public health social scientist, Dr. Patrick Harris, and cognitive psychologist, Associate Professor Stephen Most, and they'll give you a bit more of a detailed introduction in a moment. So I also just wanted to mention that we have a Slido link on our website where you are welcome to ask any questions to our panelists, either to a particular panelist or in general, and I'll try and ask them throughout the event according to the theme that they fit best under. So the Slido code should be also on your screens. So before we begin, I'll let each of our panelists introduce themselves a little bit. So Alanya, did you want to give a bit of an introduction? Hello, I join you today from Camaragua land and my name is Alanya. I'm an interior architect. I've worked in Sydney and Paris in commercial interior design and workplace strategy. I'm now a lecturer at UNSW in the built environment and the um, director of student experience for our faculty of arts, design and architecture. Two other hats I have um, on the side, I'm a, a counselor for North Sydney Council and also studying psychology. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, Professor Ian Hickey, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. I'm Ian Hickey. I'm a psychiatrist by background. I'm the co-director of health and policy at the University of Sydney's Brain and Mind Centre with a long-standing interest in youth mental health and particularly the use of digital technologies, good, the bad and the evil, and the utility in our current environments. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We'll definitely be hearing a lot about that near the end of the talk today. Um, Patrick, did you want to introduce yourself next? Hi. Yeah. Um, uh, can you hear me okay? My, my headphones are kind of a bit weird. Yep, we can I'm hear actually, you well. I'm actually on leave this week, but I'm moving house, so... Things are a little bit chaotic in my world, but, uh, but looking no forward to talking to you all. Um, I am a senior lecturer, a senior research fellow at uh, the University of New South Wales. I co-direct a centre called the Centre for Health Equity Training, Research and Evaluation. And uh, my kind of interest in, in the world is really about politics and policy. So I'm a, a public health uh, practitioner and researcher, but I'm I'm really interested in the idea of, of politics and how policy and policy making influences the environment in which we find ourselves living in. Um, and uh, particularly, uh, so, you know, the, things like infrastructure, urban planning, very broad issues around the, what we call the determinants of health and the determinants of health and well-being. That really, a lot of people probably don't even notice them happening in their day-to-day -day life, but these things are, exist and they influence everything you're doing. But the, the main thing I, I, uh, I'd like to sort of impress on people is that I think uh, policy and politics are something that we can influence and something that we should be able to influence. And I think for the generation of, of people that are your audience, it's really important that, that they get empowered to, to, to realise that you can actually influence policy and politics, often with things like climate change or, uh, you know, uh, uh, mental health issues in general. You can feel a bit disempowered by not being able to engage in politics, but politics is a process where you can engage with, uh, and particularly around infrastructure and the way our cities and our environments are planned. Um, it's a really important thing for people to, to think through and, and, and how they might take a proactive stance on influencing politics. Um, I'm also the president of the New South Wales Public Health Association. Um, and obviously what I've just said is part and parcel of being in that, that role, as well as being an academic and a researcher. Thanks. Mm, wonderful. We'll definitely be hearing a lot about all of those points. I'm glad you brought them up already. And last but not least, Steve, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Steve, Steve Most. Uh, I'm an associate professor in the School of Psychology at the University of New South Wales. Um, and I specialize in attention 
and cognitive psychology uh, projects that I, in my lab, uh, take a look at sort of mechanisms of how attention works, how we deal with uh, cognitive load, uh, how uh, when our visual environment is very cluttered, how that affects our ability to um, uh, focus. Uh, and I also look at the intersection between um, these attention and mechanism, uh, attention and memory mechanisms and emotion, uh, how things that are uh, particularly emotional in our environment uh, tend to grab our attention, uh, often to such a degree that they uh, prevent us from seeing other things that might be important for us. Um, so that's me. Wonderful. So thank you all for introducing yourselves. And it's great because everything you've said will definitely be coming up soon. So just before we get started with the big questions, I thought we could just start off with something just small and quick. So as most of our viewers probably realize tonight, our theme is quite unique because we aren't just looking at environments in just the normal way people would think like trees outside. We're looking at quite a multifaceted way of thinking about mental health. So I'll just ask each of you if you can very briefly in 30 seconds, what was the first thing that popped into your mind when you saw mental health and environment right next to each other? Alanya, did you want to give us what you first thought? The first thing that jumped into my mind is that we typically think of the physical and built environment and mental health as being a couple of pot plants, a bit of sunlight and some fresh air. That's where moving well and truly past that and understanding really that for our physical environment, our design spaces to support mental health, we need to be prioritising human connections. So making sure that our spaces enable people to come together and to share experiences and um, yeah. Beautiful, thank you. Uh, Steve? So uh, a couple of things uh, came to mind. Uh, one is something that um, I struggle with and maybe many of you struggle with, which is the, um, the distress caused by clutter around the house uh, and trying to deal with that. Uh, especially when you have kids and every time you clean up, uh, you turn around, there's more clutter there again. Um, but also how um, there's work in psychology, uh, taking, the, uh, taking a look at the, sort of the restorative uh, impact of just being able to get out into green spaces, get out away from uh, the built environment a little bit. Um, and finally, uh, I think a lot of us were sort of thrust into a position we didn't expect a year and a half ago, when um, our spaces for work and our spaces for living were uh, merged. Uh, and that came with some unique challenges as well. Uh, sometimes the way we've designed um, our living space isn't conducive to doing work. Um, and I think it's been a challenge that um, all of us have had to navigate, sometimes easily and sometimes uh, without any problem, but sometimes in ways that can be really quite stressful. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. And we will also be touching on that today. Um, Patrick? So I'm a bit like Alania. I was thinking uh, about how, uh, you know, the, the sort of a, a clinical presentation of, of mental health or mental distress or whatever um, connects back up through the sort of more complex world that we inhabit. And, and I was really interested in, in how you were going to approach this panel. And I, actually, it's interesting getting all the different speakers you've got on is that we're all sort of approaching it from a slightly different uh, interdisciplinary point of the system um, and I think it's really important and I think actually in fact science has kind of come on a little bit nowadays I think we, we can recognize the inter the interdisciplinary nature of what we're trying to achieve and and the and the effects that the well the whole system that determines one's mental health and well-being so I was actually congratulating you in my head on on what a great kind of connection connection you've got between people around the issues that that will be uh, impacting on people's mental health. So well done. It's good. Thank you very much. And um, lastly, Ian. Yeah, so a lot of my world is tied up in which physical environments in your home and your workplace and everyday life promote the optimal social interactions. Since social connections are, are actually fundamental to humans' mental health. We're social beings. We expect in small social groups and the sort of scale and the way they kind of operate. So in the pre-COVID world, I quite like urbanized environments. I quite like environments where people have to interact, where they have to share, where they have to use transport together, or they hang out in coffee shops and parks and commune. And then suddenly we've had this COVID thing. Everyone has to run away and suddenly, you know, everyone wants to live in their own separate or, or, or needs to exist in some separate castle, in some separate space, separate and be able to survive. And the, and the really adverse effects of that and, and what might be the longer term implications of that 
of actually reinforcing the importance of isolation within particular environments rather than actually promoting where we might have been headed towards the sharing of common sort of spaces and the design of common spaces so you could actually not socially distance so that you could optimally interact and not just with family and kin optimally interact in the community whether it's the workplace where you live you know that maximize the incidental but not inconsequential interactions between people that are a rich part of our ordinary life and so i think this has been a really interesting period for the way in which the way we are in environments affects our mental health and at times how that can be totally disrupted by quite unexpected effects and now what's going to be the ongoing implication of that as to how people live and work and transact their lives mm -hmm. no definitely we've already had a couple of questions from the audience about covid mental health which we'll ask later on in the, in the panel so for our first segment of today's panel we're going to start with just looking at the bigger picture how our learning and working environments, especially in the urban jungle of society today, interact with our mental well-being. So the first thing I wanted to ask you all was, so in current times when we plan, you know, infrastructure or policy, we've got a lot more focus on environmental concerns, actually, as Patrick, you brought up earlier, like sustainability and emissions. But I was just wondering, with the increased awareness and attention we have to mental health, are we seeing a similar shift in addressing mental health in decisions regarding public policy and infrastructure, like even if it's as simple as, you know, noise from motorways or on a bigger scale? So maybe Patrick, do you start off the conversation on this and maybe Alanya, could you jump in? After? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I think um, I, I saw, when I saw your question, I was like, oh, okay. So emissions and sustainability, et cetera, are, are different to mental health. I, I actually think that they, all these things are interconnected, particularly for, for a younger audience. It's worth thinking through what infrastructure is and then how infrastructure is planned and, and decisions around infrastructure are made. So, um, Infrastructure is kind of the, the stuff around you and your environment that makes cities or places or spaces work. Um, and I think um, what's tended to happen in the past in terms of policy and planning is that those spaces and places are often seen through a primarily just an economic lens. Um, I think that's changing. I think um, people are realizing, like I was just saying before, around what a complex system looks like. So, uh, you know, when you make a decision about a road, that will also impact on how people get to work, it'll also impact on where their housing is, et cetera, et cetera. But I think sometimes the system it, it, that, that we're currently facing in terms of planning and making decisions is not always optimized towards thinking through the complexities of what we're talking about. So in terms of mental health, you know, if you're um, forced through policy and, and, and planning decisions to live miles away from where you work, that impacts on uh, how much time you spend with your family, uh, how much time you're able to uh, do productive things like exercise, the emissions you're producing, those kind of things. And those kind of things aren't really, unfortunately, considered properly or fully in infrastructure planning at the moment. Um, if I was a younger person today, I would be very concerned that, that the system, the planning system is not really catching up with the issues that we're facing. They, you know, the, the younger, particularly people who are starting uni today, undergraduates, et cetera, you're in a, a really strong position of power to start saying to people, well, if someone like in the New South Wales context, our environment minister, Matt Keane, wants to start talking about climate change and sustainability, and your concern is about mental health, I would stand up and I would say, well, actually, why are you not considering this in terms of the way you're planning roads or you're planning infrastructure more broadly, like energy infrastructure? Why is there still an emphasis on four or five coal mining projects being produced, being approved every year when really there's no need for that anymore? Um, so I guess to tie it all together, I don't want to sound too negative, but I think sometimes it's important to think through that things like emissions and sustainability are really vital for, for mental health and particularly for, for the younger generation. And I'm not convinced yet that the politics and the planning is catching up with the realities that young people are facing. Um, a good example, another one is housing, right? So what's happening with the housing and the housing crisis around affordability because of COVID? I can't see anyone really taking action in that space, but that's really going to affect people's lives now and into the future if it's not sorted out. And I, there is a voice for younger people to actually stand up and say, well, what's happening to our futures here? Why is, why is the housing crisis spiraling out of control? And that's an infrastructure policy decision, and it's about the environment you find yourselves in. So I might come back to that a bit later on about how you might organise yourselves. But I think it's a, I don't want to start off on too negative a note, but I think it's really critical that people think through 
what it is that we're facing in terms of infrastructure policy that's impacting on our lives. Thank you for that introduction to that. And Alanya, do you have anything to add? Maybe also like, what can we actually even do at a policy level to really incorporate mental health into what governments do? Mm, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. There are, there are a couple of different ways that architecture and local government can intersect to really foster that that human connection, foster the the collaboration and the the social um, enabling that, that we've heard is so vital and such a key part of mental health. There are, there are of course, the... Um, the technical ways that our building environment can support mental health in terms of offering spaces that are um, that have a range of auditory levels so that um, neurologically diverse people in our environment can comfortably be in our public spaces and have places of retreat if they're feeling overwhelmed by by the circumstances but when we think of a, on a bigger planning level, there are huge opportunities in large developments, particularly commercial developments, where typically the ground floor is retail, so it's shops and cafes. Some really future-focused developments, and a lot of the time this is a collaboration between local government planning controls and developers who, who are looking to do something new, um, we can look to start translating some of those ground floor spaces into community hubs and uh, although the, the typical community hub sounds like somewhere that people come and do knitting, we, we can kind of think of them as being much more innovative than that. We can think of them as being spaces where we can, um, tenants in the building can come together for a shared social cause to have events related or connected to a charity where we can do activities that foster that sense of belonging through shared values. That's one of the really key parts of mental health from a um, from a spatial design perspective that the environment you're in reflects the values that are important to you as a human and important to the organisations that you're a part of, if it's your university, your workplace, your social group, your friends, your family. Um, one other comment I would just add, which is on, on a separate point, the, the idea of noise and things like motorways and how impactful noise can be to our mental health. There's there are, of course, um, psychological conditions and long-term mental illnesses uh, that, uh, of which there's a broad spectrum. But the idea of short-term psychological distress can be really triggered by noise and something we find a lot at the moment with people shifting to work from home, which is likely to continue on a longer-term basis is when people are working from home and there's a large-scale construction happening nearby that it, it can be quite distressing, particularly for those who work odd hours, um, not odds the wrong word, but not during the daylight hours, meaning that that's when they're trying to sleep. And so that lack of sleep due to density and, and people working and building all the shared space, I think over time we'll see some shifts in requirements for noise, um, noise reduction, um, some different considerations of construction times, um, noise insulation of construction sites, different noise dampening in residential development. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. And actually, one the, the shared connection in this space is, I think, is really, really profound because we've got some questions from the audience saying, what can we do to redesign our spaces? Now, I know this one is probably not directly in our hands, but like supporting policy or sorting, uh, supporting organisations that want these kinds of things is probably the way to go. And actually, so linking off that optimising human connection, which is what, Ian, you actually mentioned earlier during your introduction. So can I just bounce that off you then and see from your research, what have you found are the best aspects of our like physical larger scale environments that are promoting mental well-being or conversely impacting and negatively impacting mental well-being? Well, well I think you're really comment about the extent to which it is influencing planning is a really live one. And, and I'm glad to see we're representative of sort of local government here. At a local council level in your local district, this is a really live issue because development goes on at a lot of those areas. And while there's broader national issues like you know housing affordability and particular issues how things get built, where they get built, what some of the considerations are, there is a lot of role for local activism actually in that and what might happen. And I think in certain things like developments in Sydney with an emphasis through Clover Moore's emphasis on villages within the city, what are the areas, what is the degree of open space, what's the degree of shared space, what's the transport infrastructure, you know, doing away with car parking spaces in favour of everyone having a car and instead of actually sufficient public transport and a new rail station maybe, but you know, that actually encourages the socialisation, the sharing of public pools, public parks, public facilities, to see that we are better off having a good infrastructure collectively for our mental health, which maximises the social interactions while doing other things, 
maximizes the opportunity for physical exercise, for being outside, for sunlight, you know, as well as well as more efficient from an energy point of view. I think there is a lot of capability for that. It hasn't been as overt. And often there's a lot of negativism. I mean, normally, when I'm normally at home in Sydney, I live in apartment blocks and there's a lot of really positive aspects of that. And yet I constantly see things, oh, how is the worst form of housing. You know, you poor bastard, you live in an apartment. Now, on the contrary, you know, my kids share the parks, they share the coffee shops, they know everyone who lives next door, they share the lifts. There's a whole lot of communality that has to happen when you don't simply live in a suburban block separated with walls and, you know, fences in the classic, that's better and that people's mental health is worse if they're in the necessarily those spaces. In fact, the opposite in many ways. So I think there's a lot of kind of interesting assumptions that sit under what is good or bad for your mental health in the physical environment. And it doesn't, and it tends to be very individualistic at times, as distinct from a community collective kind of perspective, what's in all of our best interests. And I think mental health is this constant kind of complementarity, not tension between personal autonomy and social connection. How do you actionize most? People need to be able to act to live their lives, but they also need to be strongly connected and strongly communal on the other side of that kind of coin. And I think this is therefore within the physical planning world really to be thought about and some assumptions that sit under it about personal ownership and personal control and personal space. One needs to talk about the benefits of shared ownership, of shared space, and of actually needing to interact with humans in productive ways to collectively produce the best local environment, whether it's for home, whether it's for work, whether it's for in, in other sets of areas. So I think there are, it's interesting that uh, Patrick raised the issue about Matt Keane. Matt, people may not know Matt Keane's environment minister and now the treasurer in New South Wales, but actually he's a strong su supporter of youth mental health. Gave his maiden speech in Parliament about youth suicide prevention. So, you know, kind of, I'm kind of glad he's become the treasurer kind of currently, because maybe the treasurer gets to pull together some of these things. And we have argued elsewhere for things like mental health impact statements, just like we have environmental impact statements. To what extent does a development work in human terms, in human scale, in particular ways? So, I don't know. I'm going to urban planning here, things I personally hate, like malls and huge super things that don't work or huge super sort of stuff that's not at a human scale, other stuff that is at a human scale and that people, and humans can interact with, you know, and they can influence what happens. So I think to some degree at a local government level, but, but these are important issues also that are, are overseen by state planning and by other higher level issues, because obviously we need to make very substantial collective investments in the kind of, you know, transport infrastructure or the emissions constraint. We, there are other areas that can't just be transacted at the local level. So I think it, it's on the agenda. It's most obviously on the agenda through the debate about climate change. It's most obvious that the public has moved on, even if our politics hasn't moved on <laughs> a great deal. And then that tension, I think we're seeing in other areas of mental health and the environment where there's a lot of local discussion, but, but at times higher order politics has not yet given it sufficient consideration. No, definitely. And I will definitely admit I'm guilty of the assumptions I make about apartment blocks as well. So it's actually really good to hear what your thoughts are on that one as well. So then just bouncing then lastly to Steve. So based off your work on, you know, things that impact, impact our perceptions and our cognition, what do you have to add on this? And how does your work translate, do you think, to this kind of like a large scale level architecture built environment level? Well, um, I, 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 I've been you know, with this conversation, I'm not, I'm not so sure that my mind has gone directly to the kind of research I've done in my lab uh, as, as the first port of call. Um, certainly, the more sort of distraction, the more uh, noise there is in the environment, uh, the more um, sort of built up visual clutter there is in the environment, the less people are going, the, the more energy, the more mental energy people are going to need to sort of uh, concentrate on what they want to concentrate on. And that's exhausting. And that's exhausting and it's stressful. Um, and so uh, things like that are the kinds of things I can um, comment on from my own you know, particular research. But um, as Ian was speaking and um, as Patrick and Alanya were speaking, uh, talking about like noise reduction and stuff like that. Um, you know, one thing that it brought to mind is just how students are always coming, especially, particular, especially during exam time and wondering how they can you know, study better, how they can deal with their stress and, and it's a, it's a question that people want to know throughout society and people are interested in the latest um, you know, brain training exercises. Is this going to improve my ability to focus and pay attention? But throughout it all, it seems like there's three basic things that are a consistent thing that are always going to have a huge impact on your mental health and your ability to focus. Um, 
and, and those are, are um, uh, having opportunity to be part of a community, having, uh, you know, having places to gather uh, to the degree that you want to gather with folks. Um, exercise. So uh, the more that uh, spaces can be uh, designed, so there's opportunities, not just to park your car near where you live and, and uh, go into your apartment, but to get out and, and move, that has a huge impact on mental well-being, uh, both cognitive and emotional, and, uh, and sleep. Uh, so all you students out there who uh, take great pride in your ability to stay up late and cram the night before an exam, uh, that's... Time and again, the evidence suggests that that's actually counterproductive, um, both for your cognitive performance and for your um, your emotional well-being. There's, hard, there's few things that are as important as being able to get uh, sleep, and I think that's where things like noise reduction, like Alanya was talking about, uh, can be, you know, huge. No, definitely. So those three things you mentioned probably would really form a good basis for what policy should be trying to address: making more communal spaces, more spaces to exercise, and noise reduction. No, that's great. And then some people from the audience have been asking, so is there much research happening right now in Australia on the impact of interior built environments on emotion regulation specifically, as well as mental health? Um, I'll just open this up to anybody who knows. Yeah, certainly when we look in, um, look at emotion regulation, we look at things to do with, um, so biophilia would be, be one of the tips. The, the classic areas that we would lean to in terms of spaces where we feel our stress levels are typically lower and we are more able to regulate emotions and keep our anxiety in check tend to be spaces where we feel more comfortable and that that's typically environments where we feel that there's a connection to nature effectively not meaning the space looks like a tree it doesn't have to have you know it, there's actually research showing that imagery of trees cause uh, almost as much of a calming quality as actual plants so there's certainly the visual stimulation but there's also a lot of um, information to do with scale and form so if we think about spaces where there's a, um, a, a greater visual depth we can it tends to prompt more of an imaginatory is that a word it tends to trigger our imagination more so if we can see um, short and long distances in an interior environment that tends to activate that part of our brain um, there's also um, a lot of research around variation in forms so if we're in spaces that are very monotonous or very regulated or repetitive so essentially not organic uh, we tend to not feel as comfortable and so that tends to not be as fostering of those positive emotions um, there's also you know um, some psychological theories around refuge and retreat if we're in environments where we feel boxed in that tends to increase stress levels but also environments where we're very exposed people tend to again feel quite threatened um, you know when you go back to the the base levels of, of animal instincts and and you you can't tell who's behind you you feel not not very comfortable um, so they're the kinds of spaces we tend to avoid developing. Um, and and I, if I could uh, build on on top of what Alanya was, was talking about, this idea of uh, images of nature and, and in particular getting out into nature having this restorative effect. I was recently reading a paper on um, what's it's known as the attention restoration effect. Um, and, uh, the, and like Alanya said, there's actually, there have been very good studies done where people have uh, seen and been shown images of nature or, or had an opportunity to go out in nature and it doesn't just affect their uh, emotional well-being but they actually show an improved ability to, to perform well on uh, what we would call working memory tasks or attention tasks and uh, the paper i was reading was hypothesizing as to why this you know why you know it's, it's such a out, it could almost feel like an out there idea how, how is this supposed to work and um you know when you think about the way you direct attention every day you know, attention can just, you know, just be, draw, be drawn passively to things that happen to grab our attention. But in noisy environments, we're so, um, we have to work hard to focus on, you know, what we want to focus on, filter out the stuff that we don't want to filter, you know, don't want to pay attention to. And the idea that was discussed in this uh, paper I read was that when you get out there in nature, you know, it's, there's less need to filter out all this distracting noise. And, and it, by, it just gives more of an opportunity for attention to just sort of drift as it will towards things that catch your interest, giving more of a chance for these top-down 
effortful attention processes to sort of just take a break for a little bit. Um, so I thought that was a, a very interesting uh, tie into what Alanya was just saying. Mm -hmm. no, that's definitely very interesting. I might ask you for the name of it later so we can share with our audience in case anyone wants to read that into more detail. Thank you. And also actually just jumping onto what something Alanya said. So you were mentioning about how, you know, sometimes spaces that are pretty monotonous, like kind of all the same, just rethinking how we design those. We've actually got a question from the audience saying sometimes buildings are designed in odd ways and just really, you know, those unique buildings that really stick out um, if an architect's done a really nice design. So I just wanted to know a little bit about that interaction between the artistry of architecture with aesthetic appreciation and how that kind of comes into mental health like where does that fit into how people design those really nice and pretty unusual spaces <laughs> that's it that's such a good question so a couple of things to take into consideration so there's there's the balance between the the functionality and the aesthetic of of any space we design and uh, the sweet spot, so to speak, is where people can feel a sense of um, comfort and predictability in the sense that there's clear navigation and wayfinding. So um, I, I tend to, people can either start from one of two directions, start with the aesthetics and add the functionality or go the other way around. They're equally valuable and important in different ways. So ensuring firstly that however the space looks, it enables people to navigate through the space in a way that is calm and, and that you can predict and understand where to go. The other layer is the visual interest aspect, which really ties into those processes of, of awe and, and wonder, which is something that we hear a lot about now and really one of the functions of architecture apart from offering the space of, of, of protection from the elements and, and allowing the, the volume to do the things we need to do. It's allowing that appreciation of beauty and, and seeing things that are unusual and it has that centering effect and it allows us to, to be in the moment and um, often just, uh, takes us back into the into the present. So one of the one of the psychological techniques of, of centering your, your emotions and being able to regulate uh, so there, yeah, there's some of the key things to consider and um, that, that sense of variation also just tends to naturally keep us in tune with what we expect in a natural environment. Mm -hmm. And then actually, so going off of, what, uh, of that and about sort of what, how we can regulate sort of our own emotions in terms of the environment that we expect versus not expect, then let's actually hone in onto the home environment, which I'm sure most of us are in now. Um, it's our usual space, what we're used to. And actually, Steve, I'll start off by directing the question to you because we've got a couple of questions about clutter because you mentioned that earlier. So I just want to ask, what do you think about um, factors and stimuli in our homes and either how we design them or factors within those homes that can impact our emotions as well as mental health and stress? Do you have, like, what are your thoughts on that and what can maybe students do to maximise those immediate surroundings that maybe we have more control over rather than at a policy level? I think you're on mute, sorry, Steve. In some ways, uh, you know, the answer is just easier said than done, right? Um, there's uh, a lot of work taking a look at the impact of clutter on, on uh, stress and uh, depression. Uh, there's been some studies uh, taking a look at, um, uh, in this one study that I'm thinking of, it was uh, moms, I think they were looking at mothers who, were, uh, who described their homes as being um, uh, very cluttered and, and messy versus not. And uh, they took a look at things, the stress response, like even physiological measures of stress, like cortisol, and found that uh, for those uh, who describe their homes as being just, you know, cluttered and noisy, um, you know, they woke up with a higher level of stress. And at the end of the day, whereas cortisol levels might be expected to go down, uh, it, it stayed elevated. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the, the words of wisdom, which are much, I can speak from experience, much easier said than done is to just sort of try to keep, um, uh, get rid of stuff that you don't need, you know, to Marie Kondo the place. Um, and I, you know, I, and I, I, I actually feel a little bit um, uh, bad saying that, I mean, th there's so much easier said than done. So I, when it comes to tips for how to do that, I feel like um, we could all use some more guidance on, on how to let go of things. Um, I also recently read a, a paper that was really fascinating. It talked about sort of the dark side of home. Um, you usually think of home as being a place that's defined as a refuge. 
from the outside world, a place of safety. Um, and home is not just defined as, as a place where you just spend a lot of your time. It's also a place that you fill with sort of things that reflect your ideal self back to you. And when, um, and when it is messy, it's hard to find things. And it, 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 it can be very, very stressful. It's sort of this home environment that's supposed to be like this relaxing place uh, all of a sudden, you know, turns into a cause of, of your stress. And that can be very difficult uh, to deal with. Um, you know, even, even sort of the uh, basic um, cognitive and neurocognitive work on attention uh, shows that, that when you have a lot of stimuli in your environment, uh, what they do is they compete to drive the neural responses in say the visual system in your brain. Um, and, and that means that all this competing you know, noise needs to be resolved through your ability to sort of effortfully you know, tamp down the ones you don't want to pay attention to and um, you know, hone in on the ones that you want to pay attention to. And, and all that's very effortful. And to have that going on very you know, constantly, uh, again, can be a source of stress. So I, I wish there was a thing I could say that sounds better than just declutter. I really do. Uh, but if you can't get rid of stuff, maybe, find, maybe carve out a niche in your home where you work. Uh, you know, that, that's the place you go to uh, when you want to focus on things that you need to pay attention to. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, actually that's a good bounce off then into the fact that we're almost all working from home because of COVID now. So then actually I'll throw the question then to Ian. So now the fact that we've got so many more people working from home and we've got also those factors like clutter, noise, and all the things that can shape our mental health in our own homes. I was wondering from your background and your research experience, what are factors within our home that you think we can control and improve on to maximize our mental well-being, whether physical or emotional environments within the home? The control word is kind of funny, you know, like <laughs> true, yeah. Humans, <laughs> as soon as I said have it. This desperate need to control everything, control the home environment, control the world. I mean, what would the last 18 months demonstrate? People were just not really in control of a lot of stuff. <laughs> okay, so the preoccupation true. with control. <laughs> for mental health is kind of interesting. As Let's say maximize from, instead. <laughs> well, I think it's about actually a capacity to respond, actually. You know, it's interesting about things. I think about the whole just previous discussion about clutter, which is in the world where we've been in, has been a world of accumulating things, you know. And if you're living in small environments, you're living, you're living in apartments or you're trying to work from home, suddenly too many things. And the other stuff that matters, like social relationships, social connections, going to work, is kind of gone, you know. And I think um, this is contrary. In a lot of the work environment, work in the, in the current environment that I'm discussing, is it around flexibility. People need actually flexibility. So the working from home thing has a upsides and downsides. You know, people say, oh, you know what? Don't have to waste a large number of hours a day commuting. If you're on one of those things, I'm on the central coast of the Sydney at the moment, where over 30,000 people every day commute normally to Sydney and spend three or four hours of their day every day commuting, which has terrible kind of ramifications for family life and connections in communities, et cetera. You know, so, and a lot of people have uh, caring responsibilities, childcare responsibilities, other caring responsibilities, whatever else. The flexibility of working from home has created extra time actually for balancing those things and choosing their work times. Instead of work hours, they can work at times that actually fit better. So I think one of the really interesting things about the working from home thing isn't a physical thing. It's actually about work itself and the flexibility and to what extent workplaces a classical kind of idea, which I really don't like, actually, of work-life balance, as if when you go to work, you're not alive, you're just working. And then when you go home from work, you're suddenly alive, you know, and you stop working in a particular way. Most people in professional careers and other sorts of, that's not the nature of the work they do at all. They're thinking all the time, they're interacting all the time, the technology connection things we have all the time. But the quality of what we do and the flexibility of what we do, are you, so that sense of control, are you actually able to make choices about what you can do in different ways. Can you do it around the timing? Can you do it around the work demands? And then can you actually establish the physical environment? So in situations where people have had a lot of people in the one home, a lot of people, I don't know the rest of you, but you know, if you've got somebody who's trying, people are trying to work, or kids trying to go to school, you're trying to, and you're all trying to use the internet, you know, actually it's not all possible. Several, several arguments have broken out in my home about you'll have to get off now because my bit's more important and we can't all do it at the same time. We've got a whole lot of people who are all talking, making noise, trying to whatever. My son started to play his trumpet today while I was doing a live pod podcast on something else at the same time. You know, so I think there are just really important competing sets of issues 
in a working from home environment of your homeschooling and which hopefully won't continue for too much longer you know we have it has thrown up like okay what might be the upsides of these things what might be choices and time saved and flexibility for other responsibilities versus what kind of environments does it require and whose competing interests do we have now this is where I've come at an issue, uh, glad to see Patrick raised issue. This goes back to equity kind of issues. Those who've got more resources have more capacity to solve these things in their own home environments. Others don't. And they relied a lot on public spaces. They relied on public internet. They relied on schools. They relied on libraries. They rely on other spaces. Uh, I was talking to one of my colleagues today who was doing one of the important meetings we were doing it. He was doing it from a cafe, but the background noise was huge. So he couldn't really do it, but he couldn't do it from home at the same time, you know. So there are really big issues about who can work from home, how it works out, what will happen. And I think when we're out of the slightly very unusual situation we're in, how can we create greater flexibility in, in private and public spaces and in, in the way that we organize work in, in ways, including work hours and work demands, to, to be more flexible, which I think is in, gives everyone more capacity to be in more control, make better choices, but do that also in a more equitable way. Because what we've seen through the pandemic is it's not equitable. It's been very different for different people. For some people, a lot more resources, a lot more capability, they've been able to do it. Flexibility in their work, flexibility in their physical infrastructure. For others, it's been extremely difficult. And I'm actually gonna bounce it off to Patrick now. Can I get your thoughts on what Ian's just talked about? Well, I've had an interesting personal experience in, in the pandemic as I, I lived in a, a while my house was being renovated, I lived in a very small apartment um, with two kids, um, literally in a sort of one or two bedroom, one, well, two bed, two bedroom, very small apartment with two kids homeschooling. And it was the first time I, I it really dawned on me exactly what Ian's talking about. Is that you know that there are a lot of people who are in positions when they are actually it connects back with what everyone's talking about. If you're in a in a in a in a space which which you're um, sharing a really high density space with other people, it becomes really challenging to get the work that you want to do done. Of course, I'm an academic and I'm kind of quite privileged in what I'm trying to trying to do. And um, but for me, so I'm working on a computer all day. My son's in the corner. I'm trying to play uh, you know PlayStation at the same time. It was a nightmare. And it's really interesting to go back to this this space. Although you can hear it echoing probably now, but um, it's been really great for me to, to snap back into a, a space that I'm able to, to live and comfortably with my, with my family. But in terms of what Ian was talking about, I think one of the things we need to realise is that when something like COVID kind of hits, it does shine a light on the, the different lives that people are experiencing. So particularly our home lives and the design of our home environments, plus the access we have to the, to the outdoor world. Um, and when we think about how um, policy is made, so how, how decisions are made, oftentimes political decisions aren't made thinking about what I was talking about before is how the interconnections between different layers of our lives uh, happen. So if I'm, um, you know, working from uh, in a, in a, a, typically in, a, in, a, in an environment when I'm travelling to work and I'm coming back to and from work, um, how different is my life going to be under in a pandemic? And when when we snap back into to the world as it as it comes about um, post pandemic, I think it's important for people to think through what is it that they really want to achieve, what is it that their current environment enables them to achieve, and how can we make the best of what the pandemic's thrown up? So how can we make sure that we have, we do have more flexible working hours if that's what we want? How can we make sure that we do have better access to green space and better access to outdoor areas, better access to services in the way we want them. So not just nine to five, perhaps it's that we do need to have a more flexible environment in terms of public transport and, and the way we get to and from work and the lives we're, we're, we're living. Uh, and my challenge for political thinking is that let's not go back to the way things were because the way things were weren't always the way that everyone wanted them to be. And we might have an opportunity now that Ian was just talking about, is that we can have a more diverse way of being um, and a diverse way of looking at the world that COVID has created, right? 
So, uh, yeah, sorry, I was a bit rambly there, but I, I, I was just thinking about my personal situation. But there is an equity dimension to it for sure. And I really, really don't want us to go back to a world when we have to get into the car at nine o'clock and we have to go to the office and then we've got to come back and we've got this weird, you know, work-life balance that he was talk- Ian was talking about. One, one last thing that I think is really important for us to think through is who's doing what jobs at what time? And I think the, the, the pandemic for me has thrown up a really interesting um, conundrum in, in terms of the lower, the lower income, lower socioeconomic groups that, that are basically making the city or the environment that we live in function are often the ones that have been the hardest hit through things like COVID. And I think it's really worth us now turning our attention to thinking through, well, not only people like frontline workers, like hospital workers who have to go to work, but also the food drivers, the delivery drivers that are bringing your food to your door. What is it that, that, that they're having to, to face, face and, and, and come across in terms of their environments? And how can we make that better for them uh, in the future, given that we owe so much to them uh, for making our, our lives much more comfortable during the pandemic? Thanks. Thank you for that, Patrick. So then that sort of leads us into sort of a question that a lot of the audience are currently asking. So what can we actually do to maybe redesign our spaces or work with the spaces that we have, but maximize our health and well-being within what we can control? So maybe Alanya, I'll throw it to you because of your background in especially interior architecture as well as student and mental health well-being. So could um could you get your thoughts on that, please? Yeah, for sure. Well, I think one of the one of the first things is, well, certainly ergonomics that you know to go back to basics just ensuring an appropriate chair an appropriate work desk not one of the positives if we can find some very small positives of the the lockdowns and working from home studying from home is that it has actually gone for long enough that everyone's really taken that step of making sure we have a, a little part carved out in our home for study and work whether it's in your bedroom if you got rid of an old chest of drawers that you don't need and was full of junk to make that space um i think in the first little while everyone was quite uncomfortable and had that temporary set up at the dining table and then realized you know the, the 10 centimeter difference between a, a desk height and a dining table height actually makes makes a difference long term secondly it's really to just be authentic about your space and i think that's something we've all perhaps got better at over time that there's a big mental load of looking professional and appearing professional and feeling that our space should look and be and reflect a certain persona. Um, at the end of the day, I think we've all got better at, at life just generally happening in in our space and in our world and that's okay and not needing to feel that your environment needs to somehow reflect who you think the people on the other end of the call are expecting to look at. And also um, that it's okay to say, um, you know, to, to, it, there's no need to apologise for um, the environment that you're um, connecting to, whether it's on a Zoom call or on a, a class, and it's okay to say I'm not comfortable showing where I am. That's also okay. We've all come, I, I hope, and I feel to be much more understanding of the varied circumstances that we live in, whether it's sharing a small flat with kids and um, or flatmates or um you know, a partner who's always on noisy, noisy phone calls. It's it's okay to say I'm not comfortable um, sharing that that um, private aspect of, of my life. So that's okay, and and it's okay to say I'd prefer to contribute through the chat function in a in a call or through a um, yeah another way. Thank you. And um, did anyone else have anything to add on that particular point about how maybe we can redesign or rethink our spaces in the home? Um. In the home, I was thinking more about um, outside the home and in the local environment. Well. I, I just wanted to go back to, to one of the things that's really interesting in, in the current world we live in is that, and I, I go back to Alani's point about local government, um, it's actually quite powerful in, in the, in the, as a point in terms of political and policy systems that can actually make quite a lot of difference. So one of the things I'd, I think is, a, is a, and it's kind of is probably the end of, of my my messaging to people is that if it's worthwhile thinking through how you organize yourselves as groups of young people who are probably really interested in mental health and the environment and probably really interested in making change around the mental health mental health and the environment but one way of doing that is to organize so to become groups so you can join something like the public health association of australia 
um, you know, you can connect with people like me who might be older, a bit more experienced, or people like uh, everyone who's on the call now, and we could mentor you to help you get organised and work strategically and think through how you can, can try and make a change. But one of the other things you can do, and going back to the local government uh, uh, point, and actually there is a, a state government too, is that politicians represent people and politicians represent people like yourselves and politicians have to respond to people like yourselves as well. So one of the things that I think, one of the things that we, we should get better at is if we're concerned about what's going to happen post-COVID in relation to our mental well-being and the way we work and the way we live our lives, is write to your local politician. Uh, try and meet with your local politician and say, I'm a, uh, a, a you know, university student who's facing these pressures, et cetera, et cetera. What are you going to do about it? And raise the question with them. And, and that's, you know, it sounds really simplistic, but literally that is the way you get change happening in Parliament because these people have to go, or in local councils, because these people have to front up to their work every day and say, my constituents just told me a problem they've got in their lives and I now have to deal with it. What are we going to do about it? And as a last thing is, I think one of the, 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 the things I'd like people to take away with is that it's important not to stay silent on a lot of the things that are happening in our lives at the moment. And it's important to make a voice. And if you do, there's different ways of doing it, but joining groups, et cetera, is, is probably the best way if you feel less confident. But there are ways of making change happen. Um, and I think we're at a really important point in our lives now when younger people, particularly people who are educated at university and in positions of, of being able to express themselves and to be able, be able to um, think through complex issues like your constituents are, I think it's really important to step up and start saying, well, actually, we do want change and we do want things to, to be different um, and we want politicians to represent us in, in the way that will improve our lives in the next 20 to 30 years. Thanks. And I think that's great advice for all young people listening to us today. I think regardless of whether the issue is mental health, environment, or whatever means something to you, I think using your voice is really important. So thank you for that, Patrick. And just for the last eight minutes of this segment, um, we were just going to just final, like finish off with digital environments, just being probably the environment we engage so much more nowadays compared to 10 years ago. So just a really quick look at what maybe how is that impacting how we think and our mental health and what we can do with it to improve. So we might start with the first aspect, maybe with Steve. So from your perspective, what is what do you think the internet and the digital age is doing in regarding as like as a distraction or as a negative impact on our cognition and how we perceive things and interact with the world? Could we get your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think uh, people uh, believe themselves to be much better at multitasking than they actually are. Um, the digital age presents. Uh, uh, I mean, I, well, hold on, hold on a sec. I'm just going to check. So yeah, uh, it presents so many opportunities to get distracted and to feel like you're, uh, I can check my email while I'm talking to you at the same time and have the TV on in the background. Um, but what evidence shows uh, time and again is that people are terrible multitaskers. Uh, sometimes it feels like we're multitasking, but uh, what we're actually doing is rapidly shifting attention from one thing to the next. And it's called, that's called task switching. And uh, it's, it's one of the fundamental findings in cognitive science that uh, when we are switching between tasks, we're worse at every single one of those tasks than we are if we devote uh, you know, some dedicated time to one task and then move on to the next, next task. Um, and so uh, you know, I, I do think that's one um, uh, uh, temptation that the digital age uh, presents to us is this, you know, having the TV on in the, in the background and, and email open and, and, and maintaining conversation all at the same time. In some ways, multitasking has been forced upon us because of this having to um, work from home and, and um, you know, make lunch for the kids and, and uh, have your conference calls at the same time. Um, but yeah, I, th I think it, it, if people can get, uh, break out of the mindset of just uh, thinking that they can multitask a lot without any kind of cost. Um, every time it's been tested in the literature, when you're switching between, you have multiple tasks that you're trying to juggle, you just get worse at, at every single one. There is there's a finding that maybe about two and a half percent of people don't suffer those costs and no one knows why. They're called super taskers. Uh, but for most of the rest of us, um, uh, just try to avoid it. And, and there's, there's neat tips that I've seen out there. So for example, on the iPhone, uh, so I, I figured, I found out how to turn everything to black and white. 
you get rid of the color on the screen, it becomes much less tempting to just pick it up and look at it every now and then. Uh, I see you, Patrick, uh, looking at it. You just hit the home button three times and it'll turn everything black and white. Um, yeah, but my wife tells me I can only do two things at a time. So turning my phone black and white would be a really good opportunity. So, and, and, the, and the bad news is you probably can't do two things at a time. You could probably only do one thing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And barely that. Um, yeah, so that's just, just an additional cognitive burden uh, that we have. Uh, there, there, there's some findings that people who are heavy multi-media multi, uh, users are actually worse in the lab at, at uh, task switching, at executive function tasks uh, than others. Um, that's a surprising finding because you think that people who are are, are you know, practicing that a lot would get better at doing that. Um, so that, that was sort of like a watershed study, but um, uh, it's been questioned whether that's a replicable finding. Some studies have replicated it and some studies have not. I've just got, I've, I've got a question about this because I, I reckon it, it'd be really interesting to see, and it's, I don't know, Steve, if you've got any research or some ideas around this, if we have got better at multitasking, given we've got, in a work environment, you know, your kind of social world kind of shrinks into a screen and you you can maybe do a few things. It would be interesting to see in a, in a, a different sort of lab situation of whether or not, uh, I'm sure when the world is more complex and there's more different stimuli going on, but maybe in an environment like this, you might be able to get away with one or two more things, I'm not sure. And, and the nice thing about the idea is it's, it's super testable, right? You can you can do a nice controlled experiment on that and, and, and um, and see if your hypothesis is borne out. I would be surprised if there's not a, a couple of studies uh, exactly along that lines right now, but they're not, I can't call them to mind right now. Um, there are some studies showing that people who are frequent video game players, who have to like, you know, coordinate their actions and, and, and fast perception of things on the screen, uh, are, do perform better on some uh, attention tasks. Uh, so there may be a degree to which these things that uh, are often sort of demonized may improve uh, some sorts of executive function. Um, but the degree, the degree to which that scales up to real life juggling of many tasks is uh, I think not quite known yet. Mm -hmm. And I know for myself, definitely I had to mute every device here for when we started this panel because I knew I would not be able to focus on two things at once. But then actually then looking at the other side of the internet. So that's definitely one bad thing that takes away from our attention and our ability to do tasks. But Ian, you've done a lot of work using the internet and the digital technology, technologies to deliver mental health interventions and treatment. So could we get your perspective on how we can use it to benefit our health rather than reduce our health? Yeah, going back to my sort of opening comments about social connection. Just imagine if we did not have the technologies we've got during this current COVID. God knows what the Spanish flu of 1970 and 18 was like, or you had the distance, or people actually couldn't. We've actually been able to maintain contact with the rest of you. I've maintained contact with son and grandchild on the other side of the world, some in Canberra we can no longer visit. We stayed in contact, we've continued with education, we've continued with work in various ways. So there's the kind of obvious things, although it is demonized a lot, there's the obvious capacity we've had to actually function despite and have information despite the and it's allowed us to take the dramatic public health measures that we've actually taken in many ways. In a social connection way, important to say, and I think just in the, in the youth mental health area in which I work, which many young people won't know, is that rates of youth suicide, et cetera, were much higher in the 1990s than they are now. People think the technology invented the mental health problems we now have in younger people. Actually, they were higher before Facebook was ever invented. And Facebook was invented by young people and enhanced the social connection. So, and, and groups that were excluded in fact, in the so-called real world, actually connect more in the internet world. And so many people who are actually were isolated and disconnected and with communication difficulties and all sorts of issues actually connect more than they're less excluded than they were actually. So it's kind of really interesting ways of overcoming particular forms of disconnection and isolation and exclusion that were common in the real world as a consequence of technology. I think the trouble is it's one of those tools that also obviously in certain kinds of situations gets exploited and used and leads people into dark paths and, and the sorts of comparisons and disconnection. That disconnect, that multitasking thing, I'm taking that one home, that multitasking one. I've only ever been accused of being able to do one task at one time. And I always thought it was an asset, you know. And I think in the social world, what you do see, you know, um, the number of uh, de devices at the dinner table, even if there is a dinner table anymore, or devices in social connections. What about the rest of you? Meetings that are completely hopeless because no one's talking to each other in the same room. They're all playing with their same phone while supposedly conducting a meeting that we've all bothered to turn up with. In fact, the Zoom meetings I go to at the university now are much more efficient than the other ones where people are sat in the rooms and were playing with their phones at the same time and not talking to each other. So I think, you know, one of the issues is we've got to get the socialisation right. 
So there's, I think there are tremendous opportunities. There's connection. There's in the world's I mean of healthcare service delivery. There are huge opportunities of engaging people in their own healthcare, greater personalization of care, greater access to specialist support, all sorts of things, greater access to virtual reality, VR type systems, and all sorts of things that are possible. But but we've got to kind of work out the good, the bad, and the ugly. We've got to work out the ways in which the socialization aspects, which are unique to human interaction in, in, the, in the physical environments we're in, are supported while at the same time we make use of the capacity the capacities of new technologies. So I think we just haven't got the socialization figured. The whole thing's changed so quickly. And if you look at this as we've been looking at, the, the way in which technology has changed since 2008-9 onwards and social media as we understood really took off. And the rapid change at which it's taking place, the way in which different groups use technology is so rapidly changing. It's actually very hard to study. You know, so I think we're almost left with a kind of car wreck kind of thing what happened you know <laughs> i'm not sure what happened last time and what are people doing with it now and you know three-year-olds are breaking into their parents credit cards and you know doing stuff and you know things you know we're talking about regulating 14 year olds and actually three-year-olds are very good at it you know sort of stuff so i think the technology is sort of so amazing in its capability the socialization of it has lagged far behind that and then the social regulation of it is lagging behind as well so i think it's really challenging really challenging at the moment as to trying to get it right. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. And I think striking that balance is something we all have to sort of individually also work towards as well. And did anyone else want to add any thoughts about the digital environments and our well-being before we conclude for today? Just that my son would be delighted, or both my sons would be delighted that he and you say that, that they're less distracted than we were than their equivalent was 10 years ago. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're always constantly saying to them, oh, put your devices down, put your devices down, but obviously we need them to hold on to it. So, that's... Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. just with the young people, working with young people, I mean, to the, you know, those of us who, the so-called digital natives and digital divides, those of us who still can't work out how to do that thing with the home screen three times, you know, are in one world, and those who've grown up, you know, like in a completely different world. So we're working, and particularly working with young people and working with about some of the, so, you know, interference with sleep wake cycles, you know, interference with physical activity, interference on, on a whole sort of line of research in circadian system, body clocks, what you actually do need to be doing outside in the sunlight to be really well mentally, but physiologically. They are, there's some really challenging aspects of our current world, but working with young people and working in the social groups we're in to try and get this straight, you know, I think is one of the challenges of the environment, literally of the environments we now exist in to, um, Try and try and continuously explore those that optimise human mental health and well-being. Mm -hmm, definitely, Thanks. yeah. And that is all the time we have for today for questions. Um, so I'd first like to sincerely thank our wonderful panelists who gave up their time for tonight and created a very very unique discussion, which definitely went places I didn't even about things I didn't even know about. So that was really really insightful. And thank you to all our viewers as well for attending and engaging so enthusiastically with our panel tonight. Really sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. We just haven't had the time. Now on the screen right now is a QR code for a really quick one minute feedback survey regarding the event tonight. We'd really appreciate it if you could fill it out just to help us bring similar events like this and even better in the future. And while you're quickly filling that out, I'll just let you know about YNA's upcoming opportunities. So we have our first neuroscience case competition called NeuroCup taking place from October 30th to November 13th. So NeuroCup is sponsored by the Brain Foundation and it's a team-based academic case competition for mostly undergraduate STEM students. So you'll just have to design a preclinical or, or a clinical research proposal that will help reduce the burden of stroke in Australia. We have up to $1,500 up for grabs for the top three winners. And in addition to the money, the competition is actually offering a very good simulation of what the research world is like and will be really, really incredible learning opportunity for those budding researchers out there. And of course, support and mentoring will be provided along the way. So please just head to our website and um, with, into the events section and you'll see, to get more information about that. And also, if you want to get involved with YNA and our work, please just follow our Facebook and Instagram pages, as well as our Twitter, where you'll see a lot of opportunities like for events, resources and marketing positions and more. So thank you all for everyone to joining us tonight and have a good evening. Good night.